Welcome to this week's genealogy short take, African Americans in Civil War Military Records. To start searching in military records, we'll go into Ancestry Library Edition. To do so, you go to the library's webpage, buffalolib.org, go to Research and Resources, Databases A to Z, Genealogy, and then here's Ancestry Library Edition. This database is for access in library only. Unfortunately, it can't be used from home, but you can use it at any one of our locations and you can even bring in your laptop or tablets or other device and use it with the library's wi wireless. From Ancestry's homepage, you go to search and military to search across all the different military records. To start out, put as much or as little information as you know. I'm starting with a soldier named Daniel Abbott, who was born about 1824 in Alabama. And I put his military service as about 1864, just to give it a reference mark for the Civil War time period. And he was from the Memphis, Tennessee area. And if you are searching for those soldiers that would have served in the U.S. Colored Troops, one thing that you can try is putting the word colored in the uh, keyword field. Next, you want to look through your results and see what lines up. And this one looks about right. Um, I see it's the Tennessee area. So that's a possibility. It includes a nice profile if I click on it. This person was a private. He mustered in at April 1st, 1864, Company K, um, U.S. Colored Troops, 11th Infantry. I want to see what other information there might be. And here's a listing. Uh, this is the U.S. Colored Troops military service records and the records are scanned in this particular database. You can click on the image. And here's some personal details that you can try to line up. It does look like his age lines up. It gives a physical description, five feet, one inches, um, dark complexion, um, eyes and hair. He was a farmer. He enlisted for the term of three years. Here's a little more information. You can see he enlisted in Tennessee, in Memphis, Tennessee. Here's a muster roll. So um, it tells that he was present on this particular date, um, April 2nd through April 30th, 1864 in Memphis. And on this muster roll, uh, we see for May and June of 1864, it says he was sick in the regimental hospital since June 29th, 1864. Again, for July and August, it says he's sick in Webster General Hospital. And it continues through September and October. Um, and it turns out that he um, died, it says, in Webster General Hospital, August 28th, 1864, and that they received notice on September 1st, 1864. And this gives some pay information. Um, so you can see he last appeared on the muster roll. They had him on until 1866. And then he was paid until April 30th, 1864. And this document is from the U.S. Army General Hospital, August 28th, 1864. And it includes Mr. Abbott's place, uh, uh, cause of death, Qatar, 
which had to do with some of his symptoms must have been uh, congestion. This document says it's a final statement. It summarizes a lot of information that we know about Daniel Abbott. And um, it also lists some information about his pay and that he's entitled to some clothing pay from the first day of March, 1864 until the time of his death. And it says that he was paid last to include the date of April 30th of 1864. Back at the results list, um, there is another. It says miscellaneous cards from the uh, Colored Troops Military Service records. So we should look at that too. And this document does give some previously unknown information about him. It says he was detailed as the company cook. Another item from the results list is a register of deaths. Here's Daniel. Um, so it looks like it is the same information. Um, what hospital he was in, and it gives his date of death. You can see as August. 28th. It also gives cause of death, but his cause of death is not very uh, descriptive. It just says general debility. Another place that you could look for military service details is in the 1890 veterans census, if the soldier or a widow survived. You would want to go to the search menu and go into census and voter lists, the U.S. federal census collection. And then under 1890, the veteran schedule. Here I'm searching for Andrew J. Boyd, who lived in Michigan. If you know a spouse's name, you could put a spouse name here. You could also put um, detailed information about uh, the regiment, the company, the rank. And this first hit looks promising. You can see it's 102nd United States Colored Troops Infantry Company F. Here he is. So he's listed as a private. You can see Company F. Um, 102nd U.S. Colored Troops. I think that was a mistake. They started writing December, which should have been right here when he enlisted December 14th, 1863, and he got out November 28th, 1865, and the number of days he served. And then you can look for the soldier's line number to see if there's any further information So he was on line number 21, and you can see that it says he has chronic diarrhea and his lungs hurt. So this is the disabilities that the different soldiers acquired during their service. So I'm back at the military records search screen, and I want to see what I might be able to find about Andrew J. Boyd. I included his year of birth, which was 1845, and that he lived in Michigan. And here's one that has the right place of birth, um, or I should say date of birth, and his enlistment place, um, Cassopolis, Michigan. That's where he lived. Um, in that veterans schedule and it has the right company. And I think this might be a typo. It says he mustered out in Charleston, South Carolina. So another thing, um, there are those military service records uh, like we saw for Mr. Abbott, um, but unfortunately there's no images to go along with his and then also included is there's the index 
for Civil War pensions. And if we open it up, so we see that uh, Andrew himself filed, he would have been the, the invalid claimant. His widow applied. Um, it looks like this might be one of his children. It's, they're listed as a minor. So let's get into some information about Civil War pension files. A Civil War pension file will include applications to receive a pension and ongoing details for pension increases if a pension was received. These applications are very detailed and may include supporting documentation about important military or family events. Some files are over 100 pages long. A soldier, a soldier's widow, and sometimes other dependents such as children or parents or siblings may have received a pension. It's not necessary to have obtained a pension in order to have a file. If a soldier survived the war and qualified for a pension, the application would begin with a soldier's declaration. This would include details about military service, places of residence when applying and since being discharged from service, identifying information about the soldier. Robert Brown applied for a soldier's pension on October 28, 1908. He was a resident of St. Landry County, Louisiana. He enrolled in New Orleans on the 28th of October, 1864, and served as a private in Company G, the 98th U.S. Colored Troops. He was honorably discharged at New Orleans on the 6th of January, 1866. Robert was five feet five and three eighths inches tall, had dark complexion, black eyes, and black hair. His occupation was a farmhand and he was enslaved. He was born on October 28, 1838 at Washington County, Mississippi. After his service, he lived in New Orleans for about one year and then to St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. Another document in the file asks further information for identification purposes. In addition to the previous information given, it asks where he lived uh, before he enlisted, and he stated Homa, which is in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana. It asks about his occupation, which is difficult to read, but part of it says cutting wood. There are also some details about his enslavement. He was asked if he was enslaved and he states, yes, I was owned by Henry Forrest and brother. I left them and joined the army. He was also asked if he served under a different name in the military and he states that he served as Robert Brown. It asks if he has been known by any other names other than given in the pension application. And he said he has no other name. And then again, they ask, what name do you now go by? And he says, Robert Brown. This is a widow's pension file for Minia Cogdell, widow of Abram Cogdell. Widow's declarations were similar to soldier's declarations. It would include information about military service of the deceased husband, identifying information about the widow, and names and dates of birth of any children. Her maiden name is given as Minna Darden, and the names and dates of birth of all of his legitimate children who are surviving and um, were under 16 years of age at the time of their father's death are listed, and that's Isabella, uh, Nanny, William J., Abram L., and Abire. Two of the children are listed as deceased, when she's filling out this application, and that's uh, Nanny and Isabella. The file also states that there's no official record of their marriage. In cases where there were no official records of marriages, uh, which would have been the norm for the formerly enslaved, affidavits of witnesses of their marital relationship and or an unofficial marriage ceremony were given. These details help track family members and friends during their enslavement. This is a deposition by Christopher Green for Mary Counts, widow, widow of Caesar Counts, age 59, who was, it, his occupation was a ditcher in Newburn, North Carolina. It states, 
I knew Mary Counts, now Simmons, when she was Mary Green, a slave of Lafayette Dillahunt in Jones County, North Carolina. Knew her from a girl up to the present time. I belonged to Dick Green, whose plantation was three miles from Mr. Dillahunt. Caesar Counts was a slave of the same man that owned Mary Green. For Mr. Dillahunt bought Caesar from Joseph Kinsey. Caesar Counts and Mary Green were married in 1857 or 1856, somewhere about that time, with the consent of their owner, Mr. Dillahunt. They lived together, drew their weekly rations as man and wife, and were recognized by their owner as man and wife. Caesar and Mary were married as slaves were in those days. They lived together until the time of his going to the Yankees. To access pension files, one thing that you could do is order a copy for a fee from the National Archives. Some pensions are online for free, but it's not, it's not a, a huge number. There are some files for widows and other dependents online through Fold3, which is a subscription database. That database is not available through the library, so that's something that you would subscribe to for yourself. It does cost to subscribe. And some of those records that are on Fold3 are available for free through the National Archives catalog. For more information about those databases that I just mentioned, or for military pensions as a whole, click the video in the link to the right of this screen. If you have any questions, email us or call us with the information seen here. Thank you so much for joining us.